Um, I'm Deb Ulster, and uh, this is the uh, February edition of the Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Lecture Series, so welcome. And uh, I'm here to introduce today's speaker, who is Bob Kaplan. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, Bob uh, got his uh, master's and PhDs in psychology from the University of California at Riverside. His research interests include behavioral medicine, health services research, health outcome measurement, and multivariate data analysis. Um, he's been the editor-in-chief of Health Psychology, a position he relinquished in December of 2010. And uh, he has uh, many awards, really too many to mention, but I'll only mention a few. Uh, otherwise, we'll never get to his talk. Uh, he received the American Psychological Association Division of Health Psychology's annual award for outstanding scientific contribution as a junior scholar in 1987 and then as a senior scholar in 2001. He's received the Society of Behavioral Medicine's National Leadership Award of 2000, in 2004 and the Distinguished Research Mentor Award in 2006. He's also a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he was most recently at the University of California in Los Angeles, where he was distinguished professor in the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health and in the Department of Medicine at the David Geffen uh, School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, and, uh, but really, you know, the very best thing is that he has come here to NIH and has become director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. Uh, and we are uh, thrilled to have him, and so please uh, join me in welcoming him. He's going to be speaking today on the California Right Care Initiative, community-wide efforts to prevent heart attacks and stroke. Great, thank you. Thank you. Did you prefer that I use this this time? Yes, yeah. so. Um, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see everybody and have so many friends in the audience. Uh, I wanted to, um, first of all, mention that this is, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different than my usual talk in that this is sort of new stuff. It's uh, a lot of work that we've been doing, uh, and it's in the relatively early stages. I also should say that uh, this is supported by an NIH grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and uh, uh, it was part of the ARRA funding. I was PI on this project until the last day in January when I was still a University of California employee. She was uh, working there until the very last day and <laughs> flew here and started the NIH the next day. And Larry Fine, our project officer, is in the audience somewhere. I thought I saw him earlier. So thanks for, for this. Uh, I do, as part of my NIH contract, I'm still allowed to work on this as long as I don't take any money. So. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief autobiography. I didn't realize that, that Deb was going to uh, give the introduction, but I think it will help sort of put what I'm going to say today in context. Um, I started out doing experimental animal studies. Actually, it's sort of full cycle. When I first went to graduate school, I actually went uh, to do what's now called neuroplasticity. And I just didn't like doing lab work, but that's actually how I started. And then graduated uh, to doing experimental studies and college students. And, uh, some of these studies were considered to be large end studies because they had 50 people in them. Um, then um, when I moved uh, to the University of California in San Diego, I got very interested in public health. And this was way, way back, and many, many years ago. But I became interested in the quantification of health outcomes and measurement of quality and quality of care. Um, and then studies on regional variation in health services, which I'm going to mention just a little bit today. But they all kind of form the backdrop for some of these newer interests. Um, and then I become increasingly interested in dissemination and implementation research. So it's actually good to be at a place where Russ Glasgow and others are because um, they're the real leaders in this. And it's, it's going to be an opportunity to learn from them while I'm here. So let me give you a brief work history. Um, I started a Center for Behavioral Medicine Research uh, that was a joint effort between San Diego State University and the University of California in San Diego. But then a real career changer for me is I spent a year in the mid-1990s uh, with Jack Winberg and uh, Elliot Fisher and Gil Welch at Dartmouth. And it's, it's important because that I started after that year to see everything very differently. And I think that will be reflected in, in some of the changes in research directions for me. Then when I came back from Dartmouth, I was going to stay there, but I ended up coming back 
uh, to temporarily be the chair of the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine. It was my department at UCSD, and uh, the dean and the um, department chair had a sort of a falling out, and the dean asked me if I would do this for a couple months, uh, because I had been on sabbatical, and he said, if you do this for a few months, then um, I'll give you another sabbatical. So eight years later, <laughs> we're still doing it. Uh, but during that time, this department grew to be a very big department. So we had 90 full-time faculty, but we had about 400 faculty members and about 700 employees. And we ran four residency programs. We had three different PhD programs. And what was very consuming about this was that this department had the largest clinical practice at UCSD because it was the, the primary, primary care practice. And so the department was doing about 75,000 patient visits per year. And as chair, I was completely unprepared for this because I wasn't trained as a clinician, didn't really know much about healthcare and how healthcare worked. And this was really my sort of baptism by fire in learning about healthcare and really the headaches and problems associated with providing quality care and, and preventing the practice from getting sued, which was a major concern. So from there, I went to UCLA and was chair of, uh, of the Health Services Research Program. And the Health Services Research Department is a big department. It's one of the larger departments at UCLA. But we run eight different graduate programs, all of which are programs for healthcare providers. And so again, it gave me a lot of sort of um, feel for what types of concerns providers have. And then at the same time, I was director of the uh, Prevention Research Center and also the PI and this Comparative Effectiveness Center that's funded by N NHLBI. So, today's talk is a little bit different than the usual talks I give, partly because that this work is very much in progress. So, this is a project we're in the, where we're in the relatively early phases, um, and uh, it's somewhat unpolished because it's, it's new, so please forgive me for that. Now, part of becoming an NIH employee is that you um, are given this document. In fact, Deb just recently sent me my stuff on my, uh, my own evaluation plan. And it comes with this large PDF document of the uh, Department of Health and Human Service Strategic Plan, which is quite involved. It's 100 and some odd pages. I, I, I don't know if you're expected to read the whole thing before you fill out these forms. But, um, but I was interested in, in some of the themes that you see in the Department of Health and Human Services Strategic Plan. And one of them is that the plan emphasizes evidence-based primary preventive care and the reduction of health care costs through higher quality evidence-based interventions. And the second component of it that really uh, fascinated me was that it requires an acceleration of dissemination uh, of evidence-based practices into community practice. And in fact, that's a lot of what we're attempting to do in the project that I'm going to describe today. I think it's also consistent with uh, with this phase two or advanced phase translation. Uh, by the way, Russ Glasgow, I heard him talk a week ago, had my favorite line ever. He, he was talking about, you know, bench to bedside and, and uh, you know, bedside to community. And, and he asked, you know, what's, what's most important? And he said, it's a trick question. It's bench to bookshelf. Is the, uh, so this is, uh, we're trying to get beyond the uh, ben bench to bookshelf um, um, mentality, which I've got to say, uh, which has been most of what I've done in my career. So I want to talk a little bit about the California Right Care Initiative. Oh, this slide didn't come out well. So uh, this would have been, if, it, if the pixel was right, would have been where I used to live in the Pacific Palisades just a few weeks ago. But <laughs> so uh, the weather is only slightly nicer than it has been here the last few days. Um, but one of the motivators for uh, this project I'm going to talk to you about today is the realization in California that the HEDIS scores uh, or the uh, you know, quality assessment scores that health plans have to report are really not very good in California. And, you know, California always prides itself as being a leader in uh, health care quality, certainly in managed care organizations. Managed care organizations in California serve about 20 million people, so much more so than other states. It's a, it's a managed care uh, dominated um, state. And California is, is somewhat different than other states in that, that health care is regulated by two separate agencies. One is the California Department of Managed Health Care, which is our primary partner in this, and the other is the State uh, in Department of Insurance, which regulates uh, only more traditional health plans. And again, the, domineering, uh, the dominant partner in California are the managed health care plans serving an estimated, well, 20 million people, although it's, it's been reduced some uh, with uh, the decline in number of insured people. 
So when we looked at this, we realized that no California plan, with the exception of Kaiser Permanente, uh, scored above the 90th percentile nationally, and uh, particularly with regard to uh, control of risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Now, I know that we have a whole bunch of L uh, NHLBI people in the crowd, so excuse me for kind of replowing stuff that you hear at every meeting you go to, but you know, for the rest of us, and just to remind all of us that um, this is a project that's focusing on the improvement of quality of care, primarily for cardiovascular disease risk factors. Now, it's not to say that, that we're not interested in all kinds of uh, quality of care in other areas as well, but we settle on cardiovascular disease risk factors because uh, that cardiovascular diseases are still the predominant cause of death in the United States. And in addition to that, we feel that quality of care can be improved and can be measured. And further, we think that we have significant evidence that modification of risk factors for coronary disease result in population benefit. So again, more than one in three adults have prevalent cardiovascular disease, and of course it increases with age. And that there are uh, about 850,000 um, cardiovascular disease deaths in the United States, and a third of them are before age 75. So it's about 50% higher than deaths from cancer. Now, we became particularly interested in the evolution of uh, the dissemination of practices relevant to control of cardiovascular risk factors. And in doing this, I actually went back and read some of the original uh, Framingham Heart Disease um, publications. And I found it surprising that you know the Framingham Heart Study, actually the first publications came out in 1959, but the real data publications started to emerge in 1961. So this is 2011. So it's been about 50 years since uh, we knew what the major risk factors were for coronary disease. Um, now, I know that I may insult some of the epidemiologists in the crowd, because epidemiologists have done a lot of excellent work in the last 50 years. But it's still, I think it's worth saying that 50 years ago, we knew that um, smoking cigarettes, uh, having high blood pressure, having high serum cholesterol, and diabetes were significant risk factors for death from coronary heart disease. Um, and in fact, if you look at the epidemiology, it's evolved. There's an enormous literature. This is just uh, from the prospective studies collaboration. It's a meta-analysis of 61 studies involving more than a million adults, showing that there is a systematic relationship between, um, in this case, deaths from stroke and both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. We also know, and we've known for a very long time, that intervening on those risk factors changes the probability of death from, from these risk, uh, risk factors. So for example, lowering the LDL cholesterol uh, at people, for people at risk uh, using statin medications uh, has um, resulted in significant improvements in terms of uh, cardiovascular events in both primary and secondary randomized clinical trials. Uh, sort of this, the same, um, same thing, but different subject populations, a large number of trials, focusing in this case in deaths from coronary disease uh, or cardiovascular events, and, and I think this is, is quite a, an impressive literature. Similarly, uh, lowering blood pressure in randomized clinical trials, if you look at meta-analyses, and there are lots and lots of them in the literature, shows that if you lower um, uh, systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure, uh, you change the probability of people having events and dying of these conditions. But the real problem is in this translation phase. So if we look at the proportion of people in the uh, various iterations of the uh, National Health and Examination, um, I'm sorry, uh, Health and Nutrition Examination Survey um, for different ethnic groups, we find that, um, that about 75 or 80 percent of the population that has high blood pressure uh, as identified in NHANES are aware of it. Among those, about 70 percent or 60 to 70 percent actually get treated. But then among those, um, only between about 35 and 50 percent gain control. And we regard this as a fairly significant problem because we know from very well-controlled laboratory studies that blood pressure can be controlled in almost anyone. It may take three drugs to get there, but for most people, blood pressure can be successfully uh, achieved. Actually, if we go to the most recent evidence, um, we find that, in fact, newer studies continue to show improvements in these areas. Um, so if you look at um, the proportion of the population that has high blood pressure at the top left, uh, that it's about 30 or 
so percent, 35 percent, but the right side divides it by age. So by the time you get to be my age, virtually everybody has, I shouldn't say virtually everybody, but a high proportion of the population has high blood pressure. And we are showing improvements in the proportion of the population that's controlled, but it's still only about 50 percent. By the way, I just recently looked at a publication from China, and in China it's only about 7 percent. So it really is remarkably low. And then if you multiply these out, so if you multiply out the current uh, awareness times treatment times control, so uh, among all people who have high blood pressure, only about 80 percent are aware of it. And then you multiply that times the number of people who are in treatment, and then multiply that by the number of people in control. It comes to about a quarter of the population um, who, are, uh, who have their blood pressure in control. So we certainly can do much better than that. Now, one of the other issues that we're, we've been aware of, and this really comes from my association with the RAND people at UCLA. So RAND and UCLA and health services are, are very much intertwined, and all of our programs uh, are programs where students and postdocs go back and forth. Um, one of the most cited findings from the RAND group is Beth McGlynn's New England Journal paper that was published in 2003, showing that, um, first of all, we know that people who get evidence-based care have a higher probability of achieving better patient outcomes. But when we look at the probability that patients get this evidence-based care, it turns out that patients get the evidence-based care in only about half the cases. And it depends on what the evidence-based care uh, is about. So for example, if it's uh, about extracting cataracts, um, it turns out to be much better. So people have cataracts, um, get the evidence-based treatment almost 80 percent of the time. And if you sort of work your way up, uh, if you get to, say, asthma, it's much lower. And actually, the lowest is for um, treatment for alcohol dependence, where people get the evidence-based protocol only about 10 percent of the time. So um, in trying to sort of move California to this next level, and again, what we wanted to do was to see if, on a statewide basis, we could make some dent in this, and if we can improve getting evidence-based care to people a higher proportion of the time. To do this, we had to, to make a bunch of decisions. And one decision was, well, um, should we study the whole state or should we focus on a region of the state? And I'll sort of tell you in a while, we decided to focus on San Diego for uh, a, a bunch of different reasons, but largely because that to do a study statewide was just too big and too complicated. Then we had to figure out who the target population was. And again, we started out thinking we were going to study all kinds of diseases, but we ended up trying to focus in on cardiovascular disease. Uh, not, and by the way, that doesn't mean that we're not going to go to other health conditions in the future, but for the time being, we're focusing on cardiovascular disease. And then whose behavior uh, are we trying to change? Are we trying to change provider behavior, patient behavior, or healthcare systems? And as you'll see, it's all three, but we're, we're trying to figure out how that's going to be done. So. Why San Diego? Well, we started out working with some very innovative software developers at RAND doing what's called um, hotspot analysis. And so these are um, emerging web-based tools that actually come from geographers and others uh, that are used to try to identify components of the population that are, are higher risk and not receiving the evidence-based treatment. One of the areas that we decided to focus in on was diabetes care and partly because the databases that we have for diabetes care uh, are, are so much better. Okay, it just came, that the, the meeting I came from an hour ago uh, was the uh, Care of Effectiveness Research Committee. And in that committee meeting, we were talking about getting people to report data and, and how you would sort of uh, come together. ASPE is doing this to try to, um, to um, get common data protocols uh, across, well, in this case, the country. California, we've been working on this for quite some time, and it's actually quite remarkable um, how inadequate the data are. Even though we're working with the state office, uh, uh, State Department of Managed Healthcare, um, who actually is, can by law request components of the data, uh, we still had a great deal of difficulty getting it. But the best data set we had was for, for um, diabetes care. And it turns out that um, you know, risk factors for diabetes care are the usual suspects, obesity, uh, smoking, physical inactivity, poor diet, and so forth. And we, we became aware that in Latino neighborhoods, um, the, the, not only the prevalence of diabetes was higher, 
but the prevalence of, of poor diabetes care was higher. Um, this will give you a, a sense of, this is the, our LA map. We have a San Diego map that's like this, but these green areas are areas where there's a um, uh, much higher portion of the population that's African American. Brown areas are Latino. The um, red areas are Asian. And uh, the white areas are, um, are primarily Anglo. And so we're able to map out demographic trends, which tend to be fairly segregated in Los Angeles and, and all over Southern California. And then we were able to identify these hot spots for poor care. <clears throat> and what we realized in this analysis was that the hot spots tended to be in these areas that were primarily Latino. So we wanted to make sure that we were going to focus attention in communities that had large Hispanic populations. And so that was one of the reasons that we leaned towards San Diego, because it is a border city. It sits right on the Mexican border. Another reason was sort of personal for me that as the PI on this, I needed to, to try to pull this project off in an area where I knew people. And having been both in Los Angeles and San Diego, um, it was better for me. I had been the chair of a department that ran a big health care plan in San Diego, and I knew the players there. But also, it's a great place to try to do things, and for a variety of other reasons. So. Um, I like to tell people that when I moved from San Diego to Los Angeles, the physical move was 100 miles. So it's you know, less than two hours by car if, if, there's no, if you go at midnight when there's no traffic. Um, <laughs> but in many ways, it's like moving to Mars. I mean, things are so different in Los Angeles than San Diego. So this is a, a nice day in downtown Los Angeles, and here's one in San Diego. So there, there are other reasons that you would like to do things in, in San Diego. One of the um, the issues that we became really interested in is the way healthcare is delivered in San Diego and Los Angeles is very different. And this table comes from a paper that is just about to come out. And it looks at using the, the Dartmouth uh, database and just looks at Medicare costs in Los Angeles versus San Diego. And so if, for those of you who know these communities, Dartmouth uses what are called health services areas. Uh, and health referral regions. And health referral regions are areas, uh, aggregations of zip codes that refer to the same primary care um, facilities. I mean, sorry, the same tertiary care facilities. So if you look at the Los Angeles ones, the cheapest one in Los Angeles is the Torrance, which is near the LA airport. It turns out that it's more expensive per recipient than the most expensive one in San Diego, which is an area called La Mesa. There's no overlap. I mean, it's really re quite remarkable. Uh, you know, people would say, well, you know, did you do the t-test? Actually, there's, there's no overlap in, in these distributions at all, and it goes for uh, hospital care, uh, or for physician care, hospital care, and the total of uh, Part A and Part B in, in Medicare. And I just wanted to point out to you that, that this is real money. So what Medicare pays in these two communities it really adds up to something. So for example, uh, if you look at LA minus San Diego costs, and you do, multiply that times life expectancy at age 65. So again, life expectancy at age 65 is important because most people enter Medicare at age 65. And so the average cost per recipient in Los Angeles County is uh, about $11,300. In San Diego County, it's about $8,500. So if you multiply that times the 18.6 uh, years, that's the average difference that Medicare is spending in these two areas. But just a little aside, um, I was driving over. I have a rental car. I haven't got a car yet, but I have to buy a car because it's getting expensive to have a rental car. And I was telling Deb that that's what I have to do this weekend. So I'm looking at cars, and, and I'm not going to go this this high, but this is the new uh, Lexus um, LE something, uh, which sells for about $51,000. So if you look at this, the $51,000 for ULS, uh, it's actually equal to this difference times the 18.6 years. In other words, you could buy, if the LA people were willing to accept the quality of medical care you, you get in San Diego, you could buy each of them a brand new Lexus. And guess how many there are in Los Angeles? There's 1.3 million Medicare recipients in Los Angeles. You could buy each of them a Lexus for the savings. So uh, it's a substantial difference. But the other is that when you look at these communities, it turns out that San Diego has very high quality medical care uh, relative to other communities uh, in California. It's, it's among the higher performing areas. But if you look at, at uh, these communities, the, the top performing areas in California tend to be the San Francisco Bay Area. 
And so if you look at the top performing groups, they're about the same in the area, in the Inland Empire is Riverside, San Bernardino, and so forth. But if you look at all medical groups, the average quality is really very different in Southern and Northern California, with the exception of San Diego, where the quality seems to be high. If you look at the quality for, for diabetes care, and this is just based on these pay for performance criteria, San Diego tends to be on the high end, but it has a lot of variability, and that was the key for us, because we wanted to pick a community where there were very high performing groups, but we also wanted low performing groups, because we want to bring the low performing groups up to the level of the high performing ones. So in San Diego, there are these very high performing groups. The Scripps Clinic, uh, the Sharp Reef Daily Medical Group performs very well. And of course, there's a lot of variability on all these uh, HEDIS measures. So next question is, who's the target population? Should everyone be treated? And one of the things that we did in this project, and by the way, one of the reasons it's taken a long time to get to the data phase is we spend an enormous amount of time going around and meeting with medical groups and talking to them about what they're doing and how, how they can improve their scores in these HEDIS measures. So one of the things that we hear is that some groups feel that almost everybody should be treated. In other words, that we should treat the whole population. And other groups feel that it should be much more targeted. Now, in order to get a better understanding of this, when we talk to cardiologists, they say, well, look, that if you look at the, the way two different disorders are treated, you can look at gallbladder or gallstones. So gallstones um, are thought of as sort of a focal disease. There's no screen. Uh, the management is based on uh, typically a, an event where somebody has a lot of pain. The treatment is local. And the management between um, uh, events is, is quite variable. On the other hand, diabetes is thought of as a systemic disease. Uh, there's screening. Uh, there's management without the initiation of symptoms. The treatment is systemic, and the management is lifelong. And so the cardiologists we talked to said, well, you have to adopt the diabetes model for, uh, for the treatment of CHD risk factors. And they say the problem is that we've adopted the gallbladder disease, or the, the uh, gallstones disease model. And what we need to do is we need to switch to this model where we have uh, much more um, much more treatment, and they argue that, in fact, that the treatment should be essentially lifelong. And so they go through and they say screen, which they say they feel is very important. Of course, do lifestyle modification, control blood pressure, optimize lipids, uh, avoid, um, the, um, avoid and treat diabetes, and use aspirin, which is one of the controversial things that we, we get to later. Now, part of the problem is that when we look at this, we realize that, in fact, when you look at the number of people who have events, it turns out that although the people who have risk factors have a higher probability of these events, it turns out that when you look at, on, look at it on a population base, lots of people have events who don't have uh, risk factors. And in fact, the cardiologists we talked to were pushing the idea that in fact, essentially everybody should be treated. And part of the argument was that if, if you look at something like LDL cholesterol, when they say that when we're born, cord blood has uh, an LDL cholesterol of about um, 50 milligrams per deciliter, that people who have genetic abnormalities uh, that have very low LDL cholesterol have long survivals, that LDL cholesterol receptors are only 50% saturated, way down at 10 milligrams per deciliter, and that most of our, um, our mammal uh, that we uh, uh, are evolutionarily paired with have very low LDL cholesterol. In fact, if you look at sort of a traditional hunter-gatherers and other um, more traditional societies, they, they tend to have LDL cholesterols uh, around 100 or lower. And if you look at animals and so forth, they tend to be quite low. But if you look at, uh, these are total cholesterols, but if you look at uh, that our current society is closer to 200. They also make the argument that, um, that it's safe. In other words, that you can intervene and get LDL cholesterols quite low without providing, without creating harm. And they argue that it's achievable. So if you look at the Prove It trial, uh, that in fact it is possible to get people to LDL cholesterol levels that are quite low. So the argument is, let's just make everybody sick. In other words, let's put everybody in a treatment protocol. And it turns out that this is an, ar an argument that we ended up not going with, and we'll explain why. Part of it is I, I 
this is my, my favorite slide. This is one of my LI slides, but um, this slide says, you've got an acute case of, I think I'm a pretty healthy person disease. And this comes from a place called Glendale Adventist Hospital. They run this ad in the LA Times. I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have it all the time. And the theme of the ad is, if you think you're healthy, just go to this place, and, then, <laughs> and they'll find something wrong with you. Um, so here's, here's part of the argument and this is that we've sort of been looking at. This is, again, I showed the slide earlier, but this is from the, um, the Prospective Studies Collaboration. Again, 61 studies, about a million adults. And what they say, or what a lot of people say, is the relationship in this case between uh, diastolic blood pressure and stroke is, is, quote, linear. But actually, it's not linear. So if you look at the y-axis, you'll see that the units are uh, on a logarithmic scale. And in fact, when they did this, if you look at the footnote, they say, well, we fit the line, but we, we didn't fit it through uh, the low part uh, of the continuum. So the off-diagonal uh, point is not fit to this line. And all you need to do is, is replot this using ordinary units on the y-axis, which uh, we did some time ago. And you can see that, that really there, there is an elbow in this curve at about 140 to 150 millimeters of mercury. This is for systolic blood pressure, but very similar for diastolic blood pressure, suggesting that the relationship is not linear. In fact, for, particularly for the younger portions of the population, although having um, a systolic blood pressure of, say, 125 puts you at greater risk than a person at 115, it's only slightly greater, and that you do incur the risks of treatment, if they're pharmaceutical. Uh, in the um, NCEP, um, uh, the, the NCEP ATP3 guideline, now the A ATP4 is going to come out um, September, I don't know, sometime this year. They're working on it. And again, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's a linear relationship all the way down to, say, 40 uh, milligrams per deciliter for LDL cholesterol. Actually, it's not. If you just look at this is cut and paste right from their publication in uh, circulation. It's a log scale, and in fact, when you go back and look at the data, the relationship is pretty much like we always thought it was, so it, it is a log uh, relationship. The other issue with trying to treat everybody is that as you move these thresholds down closer, um, or down to the left in the population, you define more and more of the population as in need of treatment. So if you look at the ATP3 uh, normal uh, at 100 milligrams per deciliter, um, all these people now are defined as in need of help. Now, it's, it's a more complicated guideline because it depends on other risk factors and so forth. But the ATP3 goal of 70 cuts off a very, very tiny portion of the population. And this is true for, uh, for the JNC7 blood pressure guideline, the notion that you have prehypertension if your systolic blood pressure is above 120 and so forth. So there's substantial portions of the population. In uh, diabetes, uh, it used to be that, that diabetes uh, started at, um, at about 140 milligrams per deciliter in fasting plasma glucose, and then it got revised to 126. And then now it's been suggested that there's a new condition called impaired fasting glucose at 100, and that cuts off about 50% of the population. So each time these, um, have, these change, you cut off more and more people and make essentially more people sick and eligible for treatment. We actually did this in a publication I did with Michael Ong a couple of years ago, and we looked at, just using the, the um, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data, we just took these three categories, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, and, um, and LDL cholesterol, and we said, what portion of the population has, quote, a, a chronic disease under these new thresholds? So it turns out if it's um, um, diabetes, it's, it's 40-something percent, a little bit higher for blood pressure, LDL cholesterol much higher. But then if you just do these uh, or statements, if you say, what proportion of the U.S. population has one of these three? It turns out it's 97.2. Uh, so it's almost all of us. And when you get to be my age, it's 97, I'm sorry, 99.7. So it's 0.3 percent of the population that doesn't have one of these. But if we look at the expected health outcomes, and this is, what, this is where the debate really kicked in in our, our discussions. So again, if you look at randomized clinical trials, this is one of the more recent meta-analyses on lipid lowering. If you look at um, um, CHD events, um, so cause-specific mortality, it actually looks pretty good uh, for people with risk factors. 
um, for cardiovascular disease. But if you look at all-cause mortality, and then you look at people without risk factors, um, really only the Jupiter trial, I think, um, persuasively makes the argument that, um, that it's valuable to treat people uh, with, without risk factors. And several studies go in the opposite direction. So um, diabetes, when we looked at, and this is just one of many studies that we looked at, but when we looked at a, a series of studies, we came to the conclusion that, the, the, by the way, in this case, these are um, uh, hazards for poor CHD outcomes based on fast, fasting plasma glucose. These are all in postmenopausal women. But other studies show things that are similar. That it looks like the cutoff at 126 is probably the right cutoff. And the more we've gotten into this, the more we've come to to uh, think that some of the current thresholds for initiation of the definition of disease are, are probably the right ones. Um, well, I won't go in. There's numbers needed to treat and lots of other things that we've done to, to try to come to this conclusion that, in fact, we think treating the whole population probably is not the right idea. So back to the Right Care Initiative. What are we doing with this and what are we trying to, how are we trying to advance this? Well, part of our goal is to make San Diego, the heart healthiest place in America, because that's become our demonstration site. I've got to say that it's been really fun to do this. We now have all of the medical, all the major medical plans in San Diego cooperating. We have uh, the State Department of Managed Healthcare uh, cooperating, and we have the medical groups and the the plans themselves uh, participating in our groups. And we also have the San Diego Chargers, which I forgot my picture, but it's me posing with some of the Chargers who have been helpful. So these are our major collaborators. Uh, Government, the California Department of Managed Health Care, and our major partner there is the director of the department, although she just stepped down because she was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger, and, and so she, she left when, when Schwarzenegger went back to Hollywood. Um, we have the health plans, and uh, our regular groups uh, do include the directors of Kaiser, uh, Blue Shield, United, Aetna, and all the other ones. Um, we formed a coalition between academic organizations, and so we have UC Berkeley, uh, UCLA, UC San Diego, University of Southern California, one of the few times that UCLA and USC get together over things. Uh, we, and we have uh, a variety of different research organizations. We have um, RAND, uh, the VA, Lumetra uh, Health Sciences, which is a private organization in California. And then we have a growing number of medical groups that have come to the table. So we have the California Association of Physician Groups, uh, now the California Association of Pharmacists, and so forth and a variety of others. So the goal is to get um, all the people in San Diego who have risk factors for cardiovascular disease or diabetes um, to have a better performance on these risk factors as monitored by managed care plans. We're only dealing with people in managed care for the time being. Now, just to give you a sense of this, if you look at performance of these plans, and one of the things that we do on our website is that we do keep track of all the plans. We, get, we buy the data from HEDIS, and actually we make them public. And so we, we publish them on our website so that anybody can, can look at them. So if you look at the average in California um, and nationally, uh, about 60% of people who have their LDL cholesterol values, and these are people who have cardiovascular disease, it's not the general population, but about 60% of the people have their LDL cholesterol below 100. Um, and uh, for diabetes, it's, it's down in the 40s. If you look at the high-performing plans like Kaiser, it's about 72%, and over here about 63% uh, in the diabetes example. So we know it can be done because these plans serve very similar populations. And I think the best example is blood pressure control. So a lot of plants, and I, I, when we first started meeting with medical groups, they'd say, well, uh, it's impossible you don't, uh, because we're doing about as well as we can. Well, it turns out that if you look at the high-performing plans like Kaiser, they're actually now up at about 80%. So in fact, we have evidence that it can be done. So our goal is to try to learn what they're doing and to spread it to other organizations. So I'm going to give you two case examples. One is from Kaiser Permanente, and one is from a group called Sharp Restealy Medical Group. And what's interesting about this process is we've spent a lot of time with people, and what we've discovered is they're all doing well, but they're all doing different things. And actually, they're quite unaware of what one another are doing. So it's, it's now becoming much more public because we're meeting publicly and disclosing what, what the groups are doing. But if you look at how Kaiser 
is doing, they actually achieve about 80% uh, um, lipid lowering and ACE inhibitor penetration in their groups. And, and you can see this in comparison to their comparison groups. So they're just much higher. Now, we, when we come together with Kaiser, one of the things that we learned was that they spent a lot of time with David Eddy as a consultant uh, to try to figure out what they should do. And one of the things that they did was they looked at a variety of different models. And one of the models they looked at was the sort of general treatment, that is, we should treat everybody model. And it turns out that it wasn't working very well. Uh, they found that they were spending a lot of effort and a lot of resources on low-risk patients and didn't really have much effect on outcomes. They also found that titration didn't work. And this is one of the issues that we get to in a, in a concept that we call practice redesign, where the notion that you should screen your population, get, po get people in, have them make appointments, and then titrate their medication, they found was not that successful. And part of the reason was because of the way they practice. So again, if you think of the way that a typical practice works, a physician might have a list of appointments, and then people call up and fill those appointments up. And then that, those people that make the appointments might be about 20% of the population. So big portions of the population they serve really aren't coming in very often. So when you now try to get these people in for lots of adjustments, it doesn't work very well with the system they've got. Um, so anyway, they found that, that it wasn't helping, that it wasn't doing very well for them, and that it was inefficient, and that they were having uh, very, very little effect on events. Then they tried to do a high-risk screening uh, option, where, and this is a much more traditional um, sort of screen, treat, adjust, and so forth. And again, I won't go into all the details, but it turned out that it didn't work very well. There was no drop, particularly if you looked at events in the population. Uh, they looked at 1998 before they did this, and then they looked at it again in 2001 when they had been doing it. And it turns out that the uh, number of MIs per 1,000 members went from 15 to 16, so not much of a change. So they thought that all the things that other people were doing were inefficient and they weren't working. And so that they decided that what they wanted to do was to go back to basics. And they said that they wanted to look at um, alternative ways of dealing with these problems that were closer to the biology. And they adopted something like the polypill approach. And their argument was that, look, people have MIs because they have multiple pro problems. So you have plaque buildup, uh, you have ruptures uh, of the plaque, and then you have clots. And so you needed different interventions for these. You needed lipid lowering uh, for uh, plaque buildup. You needed um, blood pressure lowering for the, um, the uh, ruptures. And then you needed aspirin um, for uh, clot formation. And so they started a program that they call ALL. So ALL is aspirin, lisinopril, and novastatin. Now, they actually don't um, recommend these specific products. So it can be any ACE inhibitor, uh, and it can be uh, any statin. Just turns out to be these ones are cheap. And we'll get to the, that part in a minute. And so the argument was that in order to do this, you have to deal with not one risk factor. You have to do with, deal with multiple risk factors simultaneously. Um, and they decided that instead of trying to screen patients and to deal with them selectively and deal with their system, that in fact, what they needed to do was they needed to get everybody that met a certain definition and put them into this program. And this meant that they were going to deal with all people that had diabetes uh, who were over age 55, and then anybody who had had a prior heart attack or stroke. Um, and I won't go into all the details of this, but they do do slight titration of these medications. But if you can imagine how this works, they essentially take this protocol, and anybody that fits this definition gets in it. They have lots of other things that capture side effects. So, for example, um, that all of these people are screened for liver toxicity from their statins, and there's a lot of other monitoring that goes on and adjustments. But for the most part, they don't go through the usual, uh, the usual scenario of people making appointments and coming in and so forth. And their argument is that they, now this is simulation, it's not clinical trial data, but their argument was that they reduced uh, MIs quite substantially in their population 
reduce the risk of dying, and so forth, although we're awaiting better data for this because we, we've challenged them on the actual data they've given to us. Now, one of the issues is uh, how much does this cost? And I think one of the fascinating things about their protocol is that uh, you can look at these uh, the number of life years gained, and it turns out that if you use uh, a torvastatin, you get a slight benefit over lovastatin. On the other hand, if you look at how much it costs you to do that, because lovastatin is off patent uh, and a torvastatin is not, although I think it will go off patent this year, later this year. So there's a huge differential in cost, and their argument is that with those cost savings, they have more money in their plan to, to do other things. So if you actually look at the cost data from Kaiser, uh, it turns out that, that the usual care scenario, just for the medications, would be about $1,000 per year. Uh, in their uh, plan, it's about $95 per year. Or if you look at the total costs, about $1,300 per year. They have it down to about $200 per year. So with this, they're able to care for an enormous number of people and actually, I think, do it quite efficiently. So anyway, the lessons from the Kaiser uh, plan are um, don't lose focus on the desired outcome. Um, you should really need to focus on changes in heart attacks and strokes, not necessarily just cholesterol, which they think is just a piece of it. And so one of the things that we're doing as part of our project is we're getting better data for them to do the monitoring. Um, so I'm going to sort of skip this because I want to get on to the next example because I'm going to run out of time. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about another group we've been working with in San Diego. This is a group called Sharp Reese Steely. Uh, and the principal person we've been working there is a guy named Jerry Penso, who actually won the Baldridge Award for some of this work a few years ago. So Sharp Reese Steely is another uh, medical group in San Diego. It's a large one, uh, and it's, it's a very innovative one. And when we started working with them, we started realizing that over the course of a relatively short time, they had made remarkable improvements in their quality. So when they started their program, uh, the number of people who had glycosylated hemoglobins above 9% uh, was about 12. The next year it got down to 9, and the next year it got down to 5.5%. Similarly, uh, if you look at LDL cholesterol control, um, over about a one-year period with the implementation of this program, uh, it went up about 18%. Um, blood pressure control went up about 34% in a relatively brief period of about four months after the intervention. So the question is, well, what are they doing, and what can we learn from them? Well, they argue that to change behavior of providers, you've got to do two things. You've got to make the case. You've got to convince them. You've got to give them feedback. You've got to coach them. And you've got to provide incentives and recognition. So the four things that they, they do, and they have this very regimented, is um, why things need to change particularly in most of these groups, it's because they're not performing well. Where are they going? Um, how are they going to get there? And then what do they need from individual providers to do this? So one thing that they do do is they get the different groups in their network, and they give them these monthly reports. And the monthly reports are, are actually quite public, which is kind of part of the strategy, sort of a shame them and blame them uh, strategy. The second thing that they do is that they give each of the groups very specific uh, feedback performance on how they're doing and where they are in relation to the target. And then they give uh, a lot of other feedback. So prior to the visit, every patient gets a call a week ahead of time. Uh, they get reminded about um, their lab tests, the timing of medications, and so forth. Um, there's patient handouts. Uh, there's insulin teaching for people with diabetes. And then the post visit, there's a care manager that makes phone calls and schedules, uh, you know, schedules labs and so forth. And this is the, the notion of practice redesign, so that you're not trying to do this all with the individual relationship with the uh, provider. And so they argue that their rules of success, what they have very systematized, is that they have an appointment every four weeks, laboratory uh, every four weeks and then titration of medications every four weeks if necessary, so departing from the, the Kaiser strategy. And then the patients get feedback, and the doctor gets feedback at each visit. So this is you know, somebody's specific LDL feedback. And the, the um, patient is engaged. They have uh, workbooks that they're required to fill out and asked to fill out at each visit. And 
um, they do do a lot of interesting things with feedback to the providers. One of the things that we found most fascinating is that they find that providers really respond to handwritten notes from their higher ups. And now that we have our association with the San Diego Chargers, we actually have uh, a, a guy, Ralph Banershka, who was a, a kicker for the Chargers, very famous guy in the San Diego community because he, he was sort of a legend kicker, but also a very a good personality. And we have him uh, helping us write some of these notes for, to providers for doing a good job. And the last thing I'm going to mention, because I've only got about five minutes or le uh, more left, is we're looking at all kinds of strategies. So one of the strategies we're working with is, is unburdening physicians. And we realize that uh, one of the reasons that people aren't achieving their quality improvement goals is that the traditional system is just not the right system to achieve this. And the physicians don't have the time and so forth. So that if you can take some of this um, um, interaction time away from them and share it with other providers, you have better outcomes. So we've been looking at pharmacist interventions. We looked at, this is not our meta-analysis, but we're doing our own meta-analysis on uh, pharmacist on the care team interventions. And across trials, and the trials are variable in quality, but across trials, um, it looks like these work quite well. I won't go into these. So our latest partners are the California Association of Pharmacists, uh, Kroger's, which I think spelled wrong. It's Ralph's in California. It's a grocery store that's also uh, has a has a pharmacy chain and Walgreens. So, what are we doing now? Well, we're doing a lot of stuff in relation to this project. So the first thing that we've started is what we call the San Diego Rotating University of Best Practices, where um, I guess one of the things I didn't mention was the medical groups in San Diego are viciously competitive with one another, and we actually have them all now coming to a common turf that overlooks the ocean. And the medical directors of these groups are now meeting once a month to review their best practices. And that um, they're, we're hoping to get them to the point where they share and monitor data together. We're working on data sharing agreements, which is probably the hardest thing that I worked on, that is getting these groups to come together and give their data to one another and share in the interest of improving quality. The big issue is that they're very worried that the data will become public because in open enrollment season, these plans really compete with one another. And so we actually have a data sharing agreement. We're working on a data sharing agreement uh, that will forbid the use of any of these data for, for competition. And then we're continuing this hotspot mo uh, mapping analysis, which is turning out to be uh, a real interest area for us. So we're working with uh, GIS people to help us improve that. So what can I conclude from all this? Well, first of all, I want to come back to this idea that we've pretty much known about the risk factors for heart disease for about 50 years. I mean, and I, I just think that that's a remarkable number because for 50 years we've known that these risk factors are important and for at least 30 years we've had randomized clinical trials showing that intervention on these risk factors saves lives. Secondly, um, medical groups vary widely in their success in controlling these risk factors. And again, we're looking at the high performing groups, but I haven't gotten into some of the groups we work with who do very, very poorly. That most of the problems are behavioral. Their behavior, the, the behavior of these medical groups, they also involve behavior of patients, which is a whole big part of this project that I didn't get to today and that the traditional clinical model doesn't work very well. So we think that part of the solution to this problem is, is really the redesign of the systems themselves. Um, so efforts are underway to work with these groups to redesign the system, and um, that's it. I hope I have enough time for questions. Um, so thank you. The reason that we're doing it in managed care was that our original partner in this, um, before we got the NHLBI grant, our, our original um, relationship was with the State Department of Managed Health Care. And their director actually came to us and said, we have this big problem with quality in California. What can the academic community do to help us? 
So we got going with that, and in California, it's it's 20 million of 36 million people. So it, it is by far the, the biggest slice of the market. Um, but your question is is another one. How about other aspects? So other care systems, and then non-managed care. We are working as part of our coalition. We're working with other care systems that are more like managed care, actually. So the VA has become a partner. We're, we are doing some things with them. Interestingly, the military. So San Diego has a big naval hospital, and they're part of this coalition. The very hardest group to get to are the fee-for-service people, and for a variety of different reasons. The reason that we, the reason that we think we can make some progress in the managed care groups is that our, our partners are the health plans, and the health health plans are interested in this because they think it's going to improve quality but also lower their costs. And so that they're, they've been willing to come to the table. On the um, individual insurance side, I'm not sure that there, we have such, such willing partners, although the lessons, I think, are, are, should, you know, should be valuable as well. And then the other population that we're very interested in and would like to do something with is the safety net population. Um, and, but that's, at this point, the most unreachable for us. Yeah, Russ. It's completely foreign when we when we bring in. Uh, so we have a, a group, a San Diego Association of Medical Providers, that, and there there's still some small individual providers in that group, and it's it's completely foreign to them. There is a possibility. So the big in San Diego, 80 percent. One of the reasons we went there was 80 percent of the the care is delivered by just four big groups, and so and those groups are our major partners. Uh, it turns out that there are all kinds of things coming along that may provide population based management tools to the others. Now, whether or not they'll ever adopt them, I don't know. But um, so the big groups are all on electronic medical records they, and that they're doing relatively well and this is possible for them. Uh, we're hoping it's going to be possible for the others in a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been looking at that. So, so one thing I probably the maybe the most, most relevant for a lot of people in this audience, but but least discussed was what are we doing at the individual level? Part of it is we're still struggling with that because the, what we found is that it doesn't fit well within these practices. So the good practices, the population-based practices, do it independently of the physician. The physician will order it or talk about it, but the likelihood that they're actually going to spend time doing this is is pretty low. And so that it, it needs to be done through this sort of team-based model, uh, and that, that, that seems to work somewhat, somewhat better. Um, we, I mean, everybody, everybody talks about it, and they say they do it, but, but the actual implementation seems not to be good. The other thing that we're doing as part of the project is we're working with Kate Lorig and her group on patient-based self-management, and that actually is gaining a little bit of traction. Yeah, well, um, are you familiar with what Jeff Fisher has done with RX for patient care with physicians around AIDS? Uh, you know, I just heard him talk about three weeks ago, so uh, I'm a little bit familiar. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm that familiar, but I'm a little bit.
Uh huh. And then the physician writes out his RX for drugs and hands both of them to the patient, and it kind of gives the imprimatur of the doctor. So that that's one thing. It doesn't require. It gets the prestige of the provider, but doesn't require the time. Yeah. The big issue. I, the big issue is always time. Yeah. We got into this with shared decision making studies. We're we realized that, you know, if a person comes in, they've got a 15-minute interval. I mean, I really learned this at UCSD when I, when I, a lot of my job was just listening to providers complain about how miserable their lives were. And that, you know, and they would say, well, look, you know, they were, their incentive, their incentive to get people out in 15 minutes, because running late is a big, you know, is, is a big problem for them in terms of the incentive systems. And they're also incentive on patient satisfaction. So they've got to get people out the door quickly, and they've got to get the people to be happy. And they say, what happens is that somebody comes in and they'll have six or seven problems. And then that in order for the doctor to hit his, you know, his HEDIS requirements as well, he has to counsel them on, on various things. And he'd say, you know, the, the, one guy I remember very distinctly said, you know, some guy came in and, and he had back pain and he had diabetes and he had all these other problems. We went through them all. And then at the 14th minute of a 15 minute, um, visit, he said, oh, should I get screened for prostate cancer? And the doctor said, you know, just to even tell him it was a controversy would take 10 minutes. And then to sort of go through it all would take a long time. So we think that the best way to deal with a lot of that stuff is to get that done outside that 15-minute window but have the person come back in when they're well prepared. And then to use, te um, to use teams. And the, you know, the pharmacist, although and the pharmacist is just one example, but the pharmacist on the care team seems to work very well because they can do a lot of detailed adjustments. The physician is still involved with the care of the patient and they're, they're in the loop, but all the uh, time-consuming little pieces can actually be offloaded. Yeah? You started with the contrast between the LA and, and San Diego uh, uh, HSS uh, plus for Medicare beneficiaries. Is there any evidence that they're doing Yes. Well, yes. In these target diseases, what, what's so expensive? Uh, you know, I can send you my paper. It's just about to come out. But it, what, what it is, the main thing is end-of-life care. But, I mean, that, so end-of-life care accounts for a lot of it. So what happens in San Diego, San Diego has a really well-developed hospice system. And so um, more than half of the people in San Diego die with the assistance of hospice care. LA, it's like, it, it's below, well, it's around 15%. But then the second part of it is that when we looked at every little thing in Los Angeles, so if you look at the number of revisits, for example, number of times people see the, see the doctor for the same condition or they're called back, it's about 85% higher in Los Angeles than San Diego. And that um, long-term stays in the intensive care unit are much higher in Los Angeles than San Diego. But then if you look at any of the quality indicators, so if you look at you know, um, any sort of health outcome uh, indicator or patient satisfaction indicator, they always favor San Diego. So it really does seem to be an example of where um, you know less is more. Yeah, Larry. That's right. are below that number if it's at all variable like blood pressure is. So in one way, if, if, if everyone in California achieved the control rate for blood pressure of 80%, in fact, the average blood pressure in California would be much lower and would be into that space where you show the curves are very flat. Yes. Now, LDL well. might be a little bit different because we're not so sure there may be more evidence of lower is better, even though relative benefit of being 
great for someone who's not afraid of that risk. But, but have you thought about that contradiction between those two? Yeah, we've, we've been thinking a lot about this. And it turns out, because you're the project officer, you'll get our report. We, did, we had a big meeting in San Diego on January 20th. It was one of the last things I did, where we, we brought in a bunch of people. And actually, we, we had the president of the American Diabetes Association. We had uh, the editor of the American Journal of Cardiology. And we, and we sort of fought it out all day long. We had a woman named Beatrice Galam, who's, who's uh, very opposed to the use of statins. And we really sort of fought it out all day long. And at the end of the day, we came to the conclusion that, that you, you get a tiny bit of benefit. Uh, you know, it depends on how you model it out. But, but there are some risks. And the, so we got in, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, but in the, we got into this aspirin controversy in some detail about, you know, because I mean, aspirin is another good example of that. But, but I, I, I don't think you're, you're not the cause of the problem. I mean, I think historically we got there because at first people simply defined control as a number. Right. You, you know, yes or no. Right. Your blood pressure is controlled if it's below 140. Right. Now thinking that they really mean average blood pressure over 10 reading would not be problematic, but would mean that at any point in a population, you would want only 50% to be, quote, unquote, at control by meaning half or above 140 and half or above. Yes, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. It's not defined as at every Binary. measurement, you must be below 140. Yeah. Or at every measurement in LDL, you must be below 100. And that just shifts the whole distribution into, as you brilliantly illustrated in some of your middle slides, Space where we really don't have any evidence. Right, that's correct. And so an example of that is in the CORD big clinical trial that we just finished, where we had average blood pressures of 119 for people with diabetes versus 133 actually for the standard group. We did not have right. conclusive evidence of benefit, which is that you're kind of middle point. But when you look at that middle curve, we don't you know. Yeah. We don't know for sure that lower is better. Right. But if right. you continue to drive the health Yeah. Well, I think the court on the diabetes side was really a good example of, you know, th there may be consequences to pushing too hard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I just think this is, is going to be an interesting issue. One of the things that we looked at recently was if you look at the, the bigger markets for intervention now, because the, the thresholds are changing, tend to be the ones where there's actually less evidence. And this, this meeting we had got into this. So, for example, if you look at the, in the population, you look at the proportion of people using statins, it turns out that it goes up with age. So, so it starts about 15, it goes up and up and up until about 75, then it sort of levels off. And so there's this big group of people, say, between age 70 and 80 who are, are taking statins. And it turns out that's one of the groups that, where there's actually less evidence, although there's some, but less clinical trial evidence. Uh, and then as you push down to the, the lower, you know, the lower end, you know, what, it, well, what is the evidence that it's better to be at 70 than 100, for example? Um, but we're sort of pushing everybody there. Um, and the clinical trial data is actually on people that are not in that range. And then there's, you know, this complicated issue that Beatrice Glom keeps bringing up about. Well, if you look at the trials carefully, the evidence is actually much better for men than for women. And although there is now the most recent meta-analysis shows a little bit of benefit for, for women, but the argument is that, that the result got generalized to women, even though when you look at the meta-analyses, some the first meta-analysis didn't show there was much benefit for women, at least benefit for women without other risk factors. So I think there's a lot of kind of interesting controversies. And part of the fun part of this for me is getting immersed in, in how you work with medical groups to make these decisions about what they want to do. By the way, some of what they want to do is completely driven by marketing, which I hadn't appreciated. But um, you know, they they want to do what, and they want to advertise what's going to bring people into their practices.